All right, let's start in Psalm 118. Psalm 118. And we're going to do a Bible study this morning on the day of the Lord. Now, that's a big subject. The Bible has much to say about the day of the Lord, so we're not going to cover it all. But want to gain a basic understanding of what it's all about. And um, it's mentioned, that exact phrase, the day of the Lord, I, I'm sure it's over 20 times. And then sometimes it'll say the day of the Lord's wrath or the day of the Lord's vengeance. And there are many references where it just says, in that day. And in the context, you know what day he's talking about, the day of the Lord. Uh, it's first mentioned in Isaiah, and it goes through the prophets. Paul mentions it in 1 Thessalonians 5. Uh, so it's mentioned several times in the New Testament also. And the whole book of Revelation is about it. Okay, So much in the Bible about the day of the Lord. Let's start in Psalm 118, verse 22. The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. That's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He came unto his own, his own received him not. He was rejected of his own nation, and yet he is that headstone of the corner. And this verse is quoted in Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, the book of Acts, uh, 1 Peter. It's clearly about the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the Lord's doing, verse 23. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. That's what they were saying when Christ rode in, into Jerusalem, as you recall. We have in that same crowd, by the way, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Wasn't long after that, crucify him. We'll not have this man to reign over us. That's how fickle the flesh is and how easily led astray it, it can be. Blessed be he that comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. And we'll just stop reading there. But this is the day. This is the day which the Lord hath made. Now, I know people use that devotionally. And they get up in the morning and they, you know, they smile and say, This is the day that the Lord hath made. I hate people like that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't smile till about noon, you know. <laughs> and, but, and I know what they mean, and I might, but look, scripturally, the day that the Lord hath made is the day of the Lord. This, what's going on in the world right now is not of the Lord. Now, He's allowing it, but there's a lot of things going on He's not doing. That he's not making this what it is. If you want to know what it looks like when the Lord takes control, uh, then you read the prophecies about the kingdom age and what it'll be like. It's a whole lot better than it is right now. So this is the day which the Lord hath made. And it's a great day. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Now the interesting thing about the day of the Lord, you read prophecies where they say it's a day of darkness and gloominess and destruction and so on. And then you read where it says, praise the Lord, it's salvation. Well, it's going to be destruction to God's enemies and salvation to the nation Israel. And so there's both a negative and positive aspect. So let's talk about the day of the Lord. It's the most anticipated day on the Lord's calendar. And um, the Bible has so much to say about it. Satan is the god of this present evil world. That's what the Apostle Paul plainly said. And right now we're living in what the Lord called the times of the Gentiles. And that began with Nebuchadnezzar uh, in Babylon, uh, destroying Jerusalem. And it runs all the way through to the Antichrist kingdom. So we're in the times of the Gentiles. However, the times will change drastically whenever Christ comes again. Look in Isaiah chapter 32. I mean, things are looking bad, but they are going to get worse. <laughs> but then ultimately, they're going to get a whole lot better, okay? We know how it all ends. Uh, we have the Word of God. You can read the back of the book, as they say, and see how it all turns out. Isaiah 32, verse 1, Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness. That hadn't happened yet, but it will. That'll happen when Christ comes. 
Verse number uh, 17, And the work of righteousness shall be peace. And the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. This defines peace. What is peace? It's quietness and assurance forever. There's no peace without righteousness. That's why there's no peace on the earth. We live in a present evil world. Uh, there's not going to be peace on the earth until the Prince of Peace comes and sets up a righteous kingdom. Then that there will be a kingdom of peace because it will be a righteous kingdom. Now the good news is, although there's no peace on the earth in terms of the nations, you can have peace in your heart. You can enjoy peace with God. Romans 5, 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And you can enjoy the peace of God that passes all understanding, Philippians 4, as you trust the Lord day by day. And so uh, we can have that peace with God and justification to go from being an enemy of God to a reconciled child of God, all our sins gone. What a wonderful, wonderful thing to know that you're saved, that you're reconciled. It's all because of the blood of Christ and what He accomplished through His death, burial, and resurrection, salvation being that wonderful free gift through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have that now, and if we day by day trust in the Lord and live according to what Paul taught in Philippians 4, we can enjoy the peace of God. But there is coming a day when there will even be peace on earth when Christ comes. And so, uh, verse 18, My people shall dwell in peaceable habitation, in sure dwellings, and in quiet resting places. Well, that ain't going on over in Jerusalem right now, I can guarantee you that. But it will. But it will. Um, by the way, in Isaiah 57, and then I'm going to go to Isaiah 33, so keep a finger there around where you were. But Isaiah 57, verse 20, But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Okay, Man can't fix the mess we're in. Man is the reason we're in the mess we're in. Because of his rebellion against the Lord. God made everything right in the beginning. It's man that messed it all up. And if man messed it up, do you really think he has the answers to fix it? Only God does. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. All right? It's, and doesn't that describe this world, the troubled sea when it cannot rest? But look in Isaiah 33. Uh, verse 5, the Lord is exalted. That's going to happen in the day of the Lord. For he dwelleth on high. He hath filled Zion with judgment and righteousness. And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times. Strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. But notice that. Wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times. This is the times of the Gentiles. It's anything but stable. It's chaos. It's confusion. It's unrest. But you know what Paul said about when the Lord comes in 1 Timothy 6? He said concerning Jesus Christ, which in His times He shall show who is the blessed and only potentate. That's the only time the word potentate is used in the Bible. You say, what does it mean? Well, it explains in the verse, the King of kings and Lord of lords. A potentate is a supreme ruler. Christ is not just a king. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And He's going to show in His times that stability, that righteousness and peace and so on. And boy, the Bible has so much to say about what it's going to be like when the Lord reigns on this earth. Now look, God knows what's going on. He's not lost sight of anything. He has a plan and a purpose. But He's not reigning on this earth right now. He will. 
He will reign on this earth, and what a day it'll be. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. But right now, God is allowing man to have his day. It's the, the day of man. That's why about the times of the Gentiles, when it was coming in, it was, there was that dream Nebuchadnezzar had in Daniel 2 of that image. Right? Image of what? A man. And it, and it showed the Gentile world kingdoms in order. Very detailed, very specific about the kingdoms that would rise and fall. And it's the image of a man. So God is allowing man to have his day. That's why everything's so messed up. Um, man's having his day. Satan is the god of this world. Satan is the prince of this world, the scripture says. But it'll all come to a destructive end when the Lord has His day. When He brings in His day. You know, man seeks to abase the Lord and exalt himself. That's what we see going on all around us today. But in the day of the Lord, the pride of man will be abased. And only the Lord will be exalted in that glorious day. Let's look at the first mention of the day of the Lord. It's in Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2 verse 1. The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem has come to pass in the last days. Now there are last days concerning the nation Israel and concerning God bringing His kingdom to the earth. It's last days of prophecy. Don't confuse that with the last days Paul spoke of of this age because this age we're living in was not known to the prophets. So you've got to understand the difference there. But in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. And mountains symbolize kingdoms. He's the king of kings. And it says, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. Let's skip down to verse number 10. Enter into the rock, and hide thee in the dust, for fear of the Lord, and for the glory of His majesty. We read about this in Revelation chapter 6, at the end of the chapter, which is showing us the second coming of Christ. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty, and upon everyone that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. By the way, God hates pride. He, re, he resisteth the proud. So I don't care what side of the aisle a man is on, if he's conservative or liberal, Republican or Democrat, if he walks in pride, the Lord's not helping that man. Just, just th think about that. God doesn't contradict Himself. He's not going to say in His Word, I, I resist the proud, and then turn around and greatly bless the proud man. Just something to consider. The, the, he said, the day of the Lord of hosts. Um, so the first mention of the day of the Lord tells us exactly what it's about. It's about the Lord alone shall, shall be exalted in that day. Look down in verse number, look down in verse number um, 17. And the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. And the idols he shall utterly abolish. And they shall go into the holes of the rocks, into the caves of the earth, for the fear of the Lord, for the glory of his majesty, when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. And that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they have made each one for himself, uh, to worship to the moles and to the bats, to go into the clefts of the rocks and to the tops of the ragged rocks, for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty, when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. Psalm 110, the father says to the son, Sit on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Well, he's seated at the right hand of the father. 
This is the age of grace. But he's going to arise to come and shake terribly the earth. Now, um, here's the question. Is the day of the Lord just one 24-hour period, as we commonly use the word day, or is it more than that? What is the day of the Lord? Well, the word day is certainly used in the Bible in that definite, limited, restricted sense, as in Genesis 1. The evening and the morning were the first day. The evening and the morning were the second day. The evening and the morning were the third day. So when you have saying evening and morning, and you're saying first, second, that's talking about a literal day. That's not talking about a prolonged period. So those six days in Genesis 1 were six days, as we know them. They were not 6,000 years or whatever, or long periods. They were days. Evening in the morning, evening in the morning, first, second, third. So whenever the word day is used with numericals or it's used with limiting definite terms like that, it's a literal day. However, it's also used in the Bible... Um, Whenever it's used without any of those terms, without any limiting terms, it can, it can refer to a long, prolonged period of time. Like, for an example, in this age we're living in what Paul said was the day of salvation. Okay, uh, That's a great term to use for this present age of grace. The day of salvation, 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2. Now is the day of salvation. So I believe that the day of the Lord is used both ways in the Bible. I believe, I believe it's used for a literal day that will take place when Christ returns. But I believe it involves more than that when you look at all the Scripture on it. So in particular, the day of the Lord is the literal day that Christ returns to the earth. Okay, you see a simple timeline up here. First coming of Christ, his earthly ministry, his crucifixion. Obviously, right now we're living in this mystery, parenthetical age when prophecy was interrupted. This was revealed through Paul's ministry. But after this age ends with our rapture, there is a period of seven years that must be fulfilled. Christ returns to the earth, the second coming. Then there's going to be a thousand year reign of Christ on the earth, followed by a final battle with Satan, and the Lord is going to have the great white throne of judgment, and He's going to make new heavens and a new earth, and we have the eternal state. Paul called it the dispensation of the fullness of times. When God's purposes that were revealed during the times are brought to a fullness and a fruition. And so... The question is, the day of the Lord, is it this? On this day that the Lord comes back, and no man knoweth the day or the hour, I think people that know the Scripture in the tribulation period, they'll be able to have an idea of when it's close, obviously, because there are signs and there are things. But as far as the, de the exact day, the exact hour, no, it comes like a thief in the night, unexpectedly. But it's a day. It's a literal day. That day Christ comes to this earth is the day of the Lord. But the question is, is that all there is to it? Some people say the day of the Lord is simply this right here. But I'm going to show you in the Bible, the day of the Lord definitely covers that whole period. I'm going to say the day of the Lord actually covers the whole thing. I'm going to say it covers the 70th week of Daniel, the second coming, the kingdom age, the whole bit. When you look at what all the scripture says about it. Um, you have to understand, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a literal day, but then it's also a prolonged period. And basically to sum it up, you could say the day of the Lord in the prolonged sense includes what leads up to it and what flows out of it. Okay, look in Zechariah chapter 14. Let me show you this. Zechariah 14. Now we know, and I'm going to, we'll look at this in a minute. We know the day of the Lord includes the kingdom age because Peter talks about that in 2 Peter 3. So there's no doubt about that. Uh, the controversial point among dispensationalists, premillennial Bible teachers, is does the day of the Lord include the tribulation period? 
what we commonly call the tribulation period. There's a final seven year period in prophecy yet to be fulfilled is the whole seven years. It's divided into two parts, the first three and a half, the last three and a half. Some say the whole seven years is not included. Some say the last three and a half years is included. Well, I'm going to say the, the all seven years have to do with the day of the Lord. Zechariah chapter number 14. I should have marked it. <laughs> Verse 1. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle, and his feet shall stand in that day. Literally now. And, the, and these people want to come in the Bible and spiritualize it and allegorize it. How do you do that with this verse? His feet shall stand up in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. How do you spiritualize that? He's telling you exactly where it's going to be. It's literal. Which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall, be, shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valleys of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azel. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come. Christ is God. The Lord my God shall come and all the saints with thee. It shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night. But it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light, the brightness of His glory. On that day when the Lord comes and His feet set down on the Mount of Olives, it's not going to get night on that day. It's going to be 24 hours of brightness, a literal day. But that's not all. Verse 8, it shall, come, it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea. In summer and in winter shall it be, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth in that day. He's reigning as king over all the earth for that thousand years. It's that day. I won't read the. I thought about reading the whole uh, chapter, but you go down through here and what you're going to find is it says in verse 1, the day of the Lord, but then it says that day seven times. That day, the day of the Lord. And what you're going to find is, yes, the day of the Lord is the second coming of Christ, but it's the kingdom age. It extends out, so it's not just one 24-hour period. It includes more than that. That is why sometimes the day of the Lord is described as a time of darkness and destruction but also as a day of light and blessing. All right. The e, in, in Hebrew reckoning, we say, we say here in the West, we say the morning and the evening is the first day. But they say, the Bible says the evening and the morning, not the morning and the evening. Darkness comes first. So with the day of the Lord, there's a darkness aspect and a, and a light aspect. Okay. So understand that. That's how it works. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Right? It says in Psalm, was that Psalm 34? I think it is. Now, you can go, for an example, into Joel. Look in Joel, back to your left. Joel chapter 1. I mean, you need to spend time in Zephaniah, Amos, Obadiah, Joel, Zechariah. You know, these passages you never read. We ought to, though, right? It's all the Word of God. And if you understand the day of the Lord, these prophets, I mean, especially Isaiah, he had a lot to say about it. Uh, Joel 1.15. Alas for the day. For the day of the Lord is at hand as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Um, 
you, verse, chapter 2, verse 1, Blow you the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Now, what kind of day is it? A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, and so forth. But then you come into chapter 3, Joel chapter 3, talking about the day of the Lord, verse 18. Joel 3.18 shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine and the hills shall flow with milk and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters and a fountain shall come forth of the house of the Lord and shall water the valley of Shidon. So forth. Uh, by the way, it says in verse 21, I'll cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. That's the key. In Zeph Zephaniah 1, I believe it's verse 7, it, it connects the day of the Lord with His presence when He comes to reign. Now, look in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter. I'm just focusing in here on the day of the Lord. I'm taking it for granted that uh, you understand the basics here on rightly dividing the word of truth and understanding what's going to happen regarding Israel and the nations. In this age... God is building a spiritual body, the body of Christ, neither Jew nor Gentile. We're His heavenly people. But after this age ends, He's going back to His dealings with Israel. He's going to bring Him through a time of tribulation. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. He's going to purge out the rebel out of Israel. He's going to bring them to repentance as a nation. He's going to punish the world for their iniquity. He's going to come back and set up His kingdom just as He promised He would. So much scripture about that. But I believe the day of the Lord includes that whole thing. Now, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. That's why the thousand-year kingdom is just the day of the Lord. The Lord's not slack concerning His promise, and in the context, about the promise of His coming, back in verse 4. As some men count slackness, but as long suffering just were, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Okay, this the reason why this hadn't been fulfilled yet is God's long suffering in this age of grace. Peter is going to go on to say in this chapter, if you want to understand this long suffering, you got to see what Paul wrote, because God gave him the wisdom to give this to you. Peter said, There are things Paul wrote that are hard to be understood. <laughs> Uh, Paul had a new and distinct ministry, you know. So, but even though even though the the day of his coming has been postponed or delayed, it seems it's going to come. It is going to come, and he's reassuring them of that. He said, verse ten, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. It's going to come unexpectedly on this world, in the which, all right, in the which. In what? The day of the Lord. In the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, and the element shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. That happens after the thousand year kingdom. How do I know that? The book of Revelation makes that clear, doesn't it? We're not going to turn over there, but in Revelation 20, it's after the thousand. And by the way, it says thousand years, thousand years, thousand years. Was it six times in Revelation 20? Something like that. A thousand year. A thousand year. And then somebody comes in and says, there's no thousand year reign. They're all millennialists. They say, oh, there is no millennial. <laughs> well, oh, you're an idiot. Because it says a thousand years, a thousand years. A th I just take the Bible. You've got to take the Bible literally. Right. It's going to be a thousand year kingdom. No doubt about it. But after that, Satan, see, Satan's bound for a thousand years. But then he's loose. There has to be that battle. And I'm not going to get into all the reasons why the Bible reveals some things, but there's, a, there's going to be that final battle with Satan, right? And, and, then, and then he's going to... There's going to be that great white throne of judgment, and there's going to be new heavens, new earth. We go on into eternity. But you notice, it's after the thousand years, it's still the day of the Lord according to this. So it's very important to understand. I believe the Lord pictured this by... This millennial reign, the millennial reign, I believe, is the seventh millennium of human history. 
And I believe the Lord pictured this by making the heavens and the earth in six days and resting on the seventh. He could have done it all just like that. Why did he do it in six days and rest on the seventh? And by the way, in Genesis 2, see, in Genesis 1, evening, morning, first day, second day, third day, when you come to the seventh day, the day of rest, when he rests from his creative work, it doesn't say evening in the morning were the seventh day. It's like there's no end. Because even though there's a, thou there's a thousand years and then there's an interval with what's going to happen, his kingdom, there shall be no end. It continues on throughout eternity, according to Isaiah 9, verse 6. You know what the uh, millennial reign is referred to? It's referred to as a rest in Isaiah chapter 11, chapter 28, Hebrews 4. That millennial reign is called a rest. Very interesting. Now, there's been 4,000 years from Adam to Christ. And I believe there are 2,000 years between the first coming and the second coming of Christ. But see, our calendars are not, God's not going by our calendar. But I think there's something too. I think we're, <laughs> I mean, so it, it seems, now we've got the whole Bible and everything's been revealed and we can look at it. It sure seems like that final thousand years is about to start. Well, it can't start till first the rapture of the body of Christ winds up this age. Then there's a seven year uh, tribulation period. Then the second coming. Then the thousand years. Um, so this issue of looking um, Malachi 4 if you would. Malachi chapter 4. Does the day of the Lord include the 70th week? Of Daniel. You know, Daniel prophesied, Daniel 9, there'd be, the Lord showed him there's going to be 70 weeks of years. A week of years is seven years. 70 times 7 is 490 years. 483 were fulfilled at the time Christ was cut off. But there is seven years that have not been fulfilled. And that seven year period begins with the Antichrist making a covenant with Israel. He breaks it in the midst of the week. In the first three and a half years, there's a false peace. In the last three and a half years, there's going to be that time of great tribulation, Christ said, like the world's never seen. Now, the whole period is bad. The fact that Antichrist is on the scene deceiving the world is bad. But that seven-year period hasn't been fulfilled yet. It will be fulfilled after this age. The reason why it hadn't been fulfilled yet is because this age we're living in interrupted it. As you see, this parenthetical mystery age interrupted this could have happened right here. <laughs> okay? But when Israel fell, God revealed a mystery to Paul. It wasn't a plan B or an afterthought. It was something he kept secret and he revealed it to him and he interrupted all of that, put it on hold. When you realize that this could have happened here, doesn't that really illustrate what an amazing time of grace we're in? In Acts 7, when Stephen's being stoned by the nation Israel, he said, I see the Son of Man standing. He could, have, he could have brought wrath. But instead, he poured out grace, took that leader of the rebellion, Saul of Tarsus, and made him the apostle of grace, the apostle to the Gentiles, and revealed this age. But that's, that's coming. No doubt about it. Now, this is what people will say. They'll say, well, the day of the Lord has to be the second coming because of this. Malachi 4, verse 4. Remember ye the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel, with statutes and judgments. Behold, I'll send you Elijah, the prophet, before the, the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And I believe Moses and Elijah are the two witnesses in Revelation 11. And you have them mentioned right here together. Moses of the law, Elijah of the prophets, the law and the prophets... But he said, I'll send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, people say the day of the Lord can't be this because Elijah comes in here. Whether you believe it's the first three and a half or the second three and a half years is not the point right now. The point is this. If Elijah comes before the day of the Lord, then the day of the Lord is right there. And then also in Joel chapter 2, and Peter quotes this in Acts chapter 2, it talks about the sun and the moon being darkened before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And we know that happens right here at the end of the 70th week. And so they say because these things are mentioned to happen before the day of the Lord, then the day of the Lord can't include that period. But I think I've already given you the answer to this. 
And that's this. The day of the Lord is both the day Christ returns, but it's more than that. It depends on the context of how it's being used. Now, the, the wrath of God is going to reach a climax at the end of the 70th week, and it's going to be poured out. In Revelation 15, it talks about these last plagues. It says, in them is filled up the wrath of God, and then it gets poured out. But that doesn't mean God's wrath is not active before that. In other words, the whole 70th week is preparatory and leading to the second coming. God's wrath is there, but it builds and it builds and it builds and then it's fully poured out at the end. Look in 1 Thessalonians 5. We've got to hurry. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians 5, at the end of chapter 4, Paul talks about the blessed hope of the body of Christ, and he talks about we and us and, and how we're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. But then you come into chapter 5 and he switches gears. He says, but, in contrast, now here's something else. But of the times and the seasons, the times and the seasons have to do with prophecy. Daniel 2.21, Acts 1.7, two references that show you that times and seasons are of prophecy. But the times and of the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Well, Paul already explained some things to them about how everything's going to work. Uh, 2 Thessalonians, he said, Remember ye not that when I was with you I told you these things? And he was talking about the 70th week in 2 Thessalonians 2. But not only that, he doesn't have to, he doesn't have to write because it doesn't, doesn't concern us. That's going to happen after we're gone. But here it is. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Now watch it. So it's going to come unexpectedly on this world. For when they, okay, not us, <laughs> this lost world, when they shall say peace and safety. He comes in with flatteries. He comes in peaceably. He comes in making a covenant of peace. The Antichrist. False peace. When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. Peace and safety, sudden destruction. Then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Now, I thank God I don't know what it's like to be in travail with a child. But it must be bad if God likens it to the day of the Lord. <laughs> Now here's the thing about it. All right, I'm I have to summarize a lot of this for time's sake, but here, here's the thing you need to understand. The travail increases and intensifies. All right, When a woman bego, begins to go into labor, it, the, the contractions, they get closer, right? Am I right about that? <laughs> what? In the good old days, you know, your wife go to the hospital, and when she had the baby, they'd call you and say, hey, you had a boy, great, I'll come get her. <laughs> <laughs> but now, man, they want you to go to a class and you're supposed to sympathize and, you know, I, I tried, didn't I, honey? I, I, I'm not. She always reminds me when uh, there was an issue with Colton. She was in a lot of pain. Something, they, they got it solved and it turned out okay. But there was, there was some, I mean, it's already painful, but it was real bad. And she kept saying, I can't do it. I can't do it. And I, I didn't know what to say. I said, well, you're going to have to. <laughs> That was terrible, man. <laughs> terrible. I'm not a woman, okay? What do you want me to do? <laughs> I told her I loved her and praying for her and so forth. All right. So <laughs> they increase, they intensify. Now here's the thing about it. I, look, in, look in Isaiah. And we're going to finish this up in just a minute. Just hang with me. Isaiah 13. Oh, boy. So he said, as a travail upon a woman with child. All right. Jesus Christ outlined, and from here on, I'm going to have to finish this, so I'm going to just quote some things and take for granted you're familiar with these passages. But in Matthew 24, he outlined the 70th week of Daniel, the whole thing. And you know what he said about this beginning part? He called it the beginning of what? The beginning of sorrows. But that labor pain intensifies, it increases, it builds. Isaiah 13, verse 6. 
Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate. He shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be dark and is going forth. The moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. And so on. What verse, let's go ahead and read a little further. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore will I shake the heavens, and the earth shall move out of her place, and the wrath of the Lord of hosts, and the day of his, his fierce anger. So you notice he talks about this as a woman travailing, and, the, and again, and there's a whole study to this. There's a lot of details, but I, I'm just pointing something out. In Jeremiah 30, you don't have to turn there, but he talks about the time of Jacob's trouble. But you know what he says about it? The time of Jacob's trouble, Israel. It's got nothing to do with us, okay? It says, um, Ask ye now and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great, that so that none is like it. It's even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. So on. So much there to get into. But here's the point. The beginning of it is the beginning of sorrows. It builds. The day of the Lord's connected with this, this woman in travail. But the woman's in travail all the way through here. It's just building and intensifying. And, it, and then it, it, the day of the Lord comes... But all this is leading up to it, and this is what flows from it. That's why the whole thing is the day of the Lord. Now, this is very important to understand. You know, those who believe in a mid-trib rapture or pre-wrath rapture is a big thing today, uh, saying we're going to go through this time of tribulation, they say God's wrath doesn't come till here. And so we're going to get raptured out before here. Okay? But I'm telling you, Paul said we're not appointed to wrath. We are what's keeping this from happening. This can't come until we're out of here in the rapture. And I'm telling you, this whole thing is here because of the wrath of God. In other words, understand this. Um, the, the, the rapture here, by the way, that's nowhere in prophecy. That is a mystery. Paul said, I show you a mystery. The body of Christ is a mystery. The rapture is the mystery. All that's going to happen before this can be fulfilled. But I'm trying to bring this to a close because I still have a lot to say. and I might have to do another study on this. But let me finish up with this. When you go to Revelation 6, and we're going to, we'll, go, we'll do a study on it soon. Revelation 6, just like Matthew 24, outlines the 70th week. Right? All right. There's six seals that are opened. The first seal, here comes the Antichrist. The sixth seal, here comes Jesus Christ. Okay, It overviews the 70th week. Okay, In the 6th seal, when Christ returns, they hide in the rocks, just like we read in Isaiah 2. Now, people say, well, the day of the Lord is when the Lord alone is exalted. But here the Antichrist is exalted. But what you have to understand is that who opens the seals for the 70th week of Daniel? It's the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ in Revelation 6. He sends the Antichrist. The Lord shall send them a strong delusion. The world rejected God and His truth, so He says, I'll give you what you want. Here comes the lie. It's, the Lord. it's because of God's wrath on this world He allows us to come in and to take place. The Lord. So, in other words, you need to understand that the 70th week is under God's control. He is the one allowing all this to happen. And in Revelation it says, John said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now I don't have time to develop this, but I believe the Lord's day in Revelation 1.10 is the day of the Lord. So John was transported in the Spirit out into the future to be an eyewitness of the day of the Lord. And what does John write about in the book of Revelation? The 70th week of Daniel primarily the second coming, and then he mentions the kingdom age and so forth and the eternal state. So 
If the Lord's day in Revelation 1.10 is the day of the Lord, and I believe it is, that proves that whole period is the day of the Lord. Alright? And so... Um, What I want to do next, I'm going to do another study on this because there's more I want to get. And here's what I'm going to show you next time. I want to emphasize what happens here. And this proves a pre-trib rapture. Let me just mention it and then we'll develop it. You know what happens right here? Here's why there's, a, it's, there's three and a half and three and a half. You know what happens right here? The Antichrist has a death, burial, and resurrection. And the man of sin becomes the son of perdition. He's Satan incarnate. You know what co coincides? Satan and his angels are cast out of heaven right here. Or at least a third of them, the rest of them are cast down here. Which, by the way, when it talks about stars falling to the earth, that's talking about angels. Now, what's going to happen? We are caught up, we go through the judgment seat of Christ to determine how we're going to reign in Christ's heavenly kingdom. So when Satan and his angels are cast out right here, we're already ready. We've already been judged. We've already been glorified and judged. We're ready to take those roles. We fill those thrones and dominions and principalities and powers. The day of the Lord includes, and Paul talks about the day of Christ. It's got to do with judgment. Okay? Now, in Isaiah, this battle of the Lord starts in heaven, then comes to the earth. So the day the Lord has to be in here because it's got to do with Him kicking Satan out of heaven. Not the third heaven, but the second heaven. But in order for that to be, we have to be caught up before. Now I just mentioned it. We'll have to develop it in another study. Father, thank You for the time.